So Spence, for those in the agency world, you need no introduction whatsoever. Um, but for those of the audience who may not have heard of you or met you, um, you run one of the leading, well, the leading UK agency growth consultancies, Cactus. You're also co-founder of Cactus Academy, which is online training for agency leaders. You're also the author um, of the best-selling book, Agency Nomics, which is a phenomenal book for anyone growing an agency. And you also run the biggest global community for agency owners of the same name, Agency Nomics. And you're also the host of the vodcast, Agency Phonics. So I'm thrilled because I know you advise companies, you're a non-exec, you do a lot of speaking gigs. So to get some time with you, um, because I know you usually sit on this side of the fence, is is an absolute um, delight for me. I'm absolutely thrilled. Um, Just a short intro before I pass over to you to ask you to talk a bit about your history. We obviously met a couple of years ago. um, And what struck me about you was, first of all, your energy, which is phenomenal. I just, just don't know how you get everything done but also how you essentially adopted me into the Cactus and Agency Nomics family, which I will be forever grateful for. And you've also got on to trust me with many of your clients. So I just feel so at home in the community. I think you you surround, you obviously attract uh, a really decent, lovely type of person. And you've created this really supportive community, which is really active, really involved. And you just seemed so generous with everybody that you meet. So I would love you to share your journey with us because I obviously haven't mentioned the fact that you built a 20 million turnover agency and sold it. So I would love you to share your journey with us. Thank you. Well, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you. And when I hear it back, I sometimes I'm also thinking, wow, how do I find time to do all those things myself? <laughs> yeah. No wonder I'm so busy. If I had a complaint this week from someone who said um, your PA, Abby, who you know very well, uh, has said um, it's currently 58 days to get a meeting with you. <laughs> and I'm I was trying so to make the point that I actually look after about 100 million pounds worth of agencies with a thousand staff. And I think people don't don't always realize what I do in my day job. Um, agency nomics is obviously something that I do as a bit of a charity sort of social enterprise pay it forward in my spare time um, but um, but yeah I mean a brief history of time um, I you know I'm, I'm one of those kind of classic entrepreneur types I think you know I left school at 16 um, no qualifications left home at 16 didn't have the best start in life you know worked in clothes shops selling clothes and life uh, didn't look too good i actually live near a helicopter base and there's a helicopter about to fly over so i, I apologize if you suddenly hear a chinook going above um and so, so life wasn't that good for me in the beginning it wasn't like you know pure poverty but put it this way you know brought myself up and it and and you know life wasn't wasn't simple and had to be quite independent from a young age and i don't know like i i just worked really hard at everything i did and i got some lucky breaks and I ended up um, at the age of about 27, getting made redundant. Uh, I went through three jobs in a year, got made redundant twice and decided that in my spare time, I'd been playing on this thing called the internet uh, back for, since about 93. So to give you an idea, Tim Berners-Lee came up with the uh, internet uh, HTML in, two, in 1991. So two years later, I'm, I've ta- self-taught myself to write websites and after being made redundant, I from a purple shed in my mum's back garden, I started to build websites and I started to build at the time what I thought was a web development company. And then about three years later, somebody walked into the business and went, I really love your agency. And I was like, what's an agency? <laughs> and then from that moment onwards, it, it the, you know, the, the business really, really grew quickly. So, so that's kind of briefly how I started. Um, obviously I started building websites um, when it was, a joke to build websites like if you tell people you built websites in the year 2000 they'd laugh at you because it's a bit like cryptocurrency or, or bitcoin today and so i um you know there were some tough times i think we called ourselves new media agencies back then and we did and so you know cut a long story short i won i got a couple of big breaks one of them was tottenham hotspur football club and i then became very big in sports and i ended up um, building websites for people like the nfl uh, for Andy Murray, I put a fact, worked with Amy and uh, Jamie, not Amy, Jamie and Andy Murray f- before they were, you know, big time. Really, you know, Judy used to come down into the offices, so we did a lot in sport. We had, our sports was our niche, 
but we did end up working with other companies like we, we cancer research a big client before we used uh iphones and samsung's we used uh blackberry so blackberry or crackberry if we used to call them was our yeah. client and so so yeah i was very fortunate grew it organically no investment deloitte tech fast 50 growing business and ended up um ended up in sort of 2008 really the big ad, the big ad agencies had missed out on digital if you remember back then they would call the digital team in their agency the dark arts department or they had like a separate division with a different name that did digital and a lot of big companies had missed out they hadn't found a way to integrate digital into their advertising and marketing so they uh, so i got i sold the business very successfully i was the only, only owner of the business um, and at 37, I kind of retired, really. I sort of stopped working. And my last pitch in an agency, I, I share this story sometimes to was it was 63 hours with three hours sleep. And it was for a, uh, the global business for Technicolor to do the rebrand and the global website development. And after kind of stopping work in 2010, I decided that I would never work or set foot in an agency ever again because I was just so burnt out. But the reality was, after a year of sort of stopping working and, and having some time out, um, a lot of my old friends, my old competitors, my frenemies would ring me up and say, hey, listen, there's a new era needed for a non-exec that understands technology, not just that madman era. There were a lot of non-execs 10 years ago who were very much from the advertising and marketing traditional world, whereas... I was very much from the new world and I've been, you know, because I've been there and done it and did it organically. I think there's a lot of connection there. So, so we started Cactus and that was nine, nine, ten, nine years ago now, nine years ago. And yeah, it's been, a, it's been an amazing journey. You know, we've worked with thousands of agencies, as you said, written a book and, and um, it's been a lot of hard work, but I'm really proud of everything we've achieved. I, you right. should be as well. It's a phenomenal achievement. What drives you now? What drives you to continue? Well, I think it's still the same thing. You know, I was a 16 year old who left school with no qualifications, who left home at 16 and I, I felt a failure. And so I've always been driven by the fear of proving that I'm not a failure. And I think, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, I've always wanted to be successful. In fact, even when I sold the business, I actually, I sort of fell off the top of Maslow's triangle and, and crashed down because I'd sold the one thing that had made me successful and I had nothing to show for it anymore necessarily. I obviously had a nice house and car and a lovely family and, you know, but it, but I didn't really have something that I had built and, and, you know, had, had made, you know, I'd sold it. And so in a way I then had to sort of rebuild that. So the driver with cactus all along is, I guess, you know, a lot of people say, you know, um, you, you know, you could be one hit wonder, I guess, you know, you can build, you know, a lot of people say, oh, just because you build one web, uh, one, one uh, business and sell it doesn't mean that you can do it again. Well, I think a couple of people said that to me. In fact, you just reminded me, there was a statistic that said something like, and this is true, like only 30% of people who build and sell a business go on to do it again. So I wanted to prove that I could do it again. And I think, you know, we've, we've done that through characters time and time again now through our clients and through the investments we've made, so. Do you know what I love you've shared with that because I was just reflecting and I, I'm sure a lot of people hearing that very open story and really honest story will identify with that because I think many of us, like I didn't go to university and it's almost like, I mean, maybe in those days it wasn't so common, but that kind of drives me. And also, I think you've got a shared love of personal development. You're always reading, aren't you? I mean, you interviewed, um, oh, what's the guy that wrote the book of, um, Key Person of Influence? Daniel Priestley. Daniel Priestley. Yeah, like you, I managed to get Daniel Priestley on my, know, on my podcast. Amazing. So you're always... Um, developing yourself and your on your yeah i mean i'm I, you know i think um if you if it's funny because i there were there were sort of two or three books along the journey that really helped me shape who i am and when i say them you, you know you'll laugh because they're the books that you probably see time and time again people always promoting but i read those and the first book actually was it wasn't the secret but it was, I was discussing this this morning with someone, it was a book with a red cover and it basically said how to be successful in life. This is a 16 year old me going, I'm earning 70 pounds a week selling clothes in Foster's, which is like top man in, in a small town in Surrey. 
um, and my life's not looking great. And I read this book. I find I find uh, in it's actually so I, I left home at my with my mom at fifteen. My parents were divorced. I went moved to my dad at dad's house, and he had it in his just as I left home at 16, he had it on the bookshelf and it, it was something like, it was either called how to be a millionaire or how to be successful. Some one of those books. And I read it and it said, you know, close your eyes, sit somewhere comfortable and imagine your life three years from now. Now, look, I, listen, I had no, nothing. I had no qualifications. So at this point, I don't have anything other than this book telling me how I'm going to, I don't know, do something with my life. But I did it. I closed my eyes. And I said, by the time I'm 20, I want to earn 20,000 pounds a year, which bearing in mind from where I was, 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 quite an achievement um to give you an idea i think sort of i was earning about four thousand pounds four and a half thousand pounds a year and that would probably be about the equivalent of about ten thousand today so 20 would probably be about what forty thousand pounds today i want to have a company car and i want to own my own house and three years from that day i bought my first house i was 19 years old interest rates were 15 percent, not one percent like they are now 15 percent. i got a first time buyer's discount but I, but I, I, for some reason, the visualization worked. Now, I don't know whether it was the manifestation or the secret, or it was just the neuroscience, the fact that, you know, you achieve things, you know, human beings, where we draw our attention to, we focus and we achieve things. And, it, you know, it, who knows what the answer is? I still don't know. But what I do know is it worked. And so the first lesson I learned was about visualization and uh, visualizing your future. And, and it's, even today, you know, every day I read out a, a daily gratitude list where I'm grateful for the outcomes that are going to happen to me. So that was the first one. The second one was how to win friends and influence people. And, and that taught me, gave me an ability at the time to be able to talk to anybody. I think I kind of had that anyway, because I was in the bottom set for everything at school. So I hung around with the rough kids, but then I was reasonably sporty enough to know the wealthy kids. So I could kind of adapt up and down a little bit. That probably helps you in sales, but, but actually reading that book, um, really got me sort of, you know, that was, a, you know, how do we friends maybe me realize actually the power of influence, if you can get, you know, if you can be, what's the saying, you know, to be interesting, you have to be interested and just all of those techniques. And then lastly, it was the think and grow rich, which really underpinned the first book. And, you know, for those people, it's a book that was written in 1927, think and grow rich. And, um, you know, the book, was at the time, you know, just it, it, it just really struck a chord with me in many, many ways. And so they were the kind of the early bits of reading I did. And what I found was because a lot of the learnings from those books really helped me, I realized that a real education in life actually starts the day you leave school, not the day, you know, not when you finish, don't, don't stop school and then just stop learning. You have to almost go, you know, and in fact, even I remember two, three years ago when digital technology started moving much more into distributed crypto AI, you know, I went out every morning, walked 10 miles, well, between six and uh, 10K and six and 10 miles, like listening to audio uh, books and podcasts around AI, machine learning, trying to make sure that I'm staying relevant and I'm learning new things. So, um, yeah, so journey of learning has been really at the heart of everything I do. And do you think that's the secret of success for an agency owner? Because I'm sure there's agency owners listening to this thinking, you know, I, I really would like to have whatever Spencer's got to accelerate my agency's growth. What do I need to be doing differently? So okay. do you do you see when you meet so many that the ones that stand out for you, you can see that they're going to be more successful? Are there any kind of traits? So the reality is is that we're complicated people human beings and i think that i'm very fortunate in like a couple of my superpowers that are able to are able to sort of cut through so where some people overly procrastinate or suffer from imposter syndrome or have you know barriers from psychological barriers from when they were younger you know, stage fright whatever it may well be i'm someone who's always i i I'm someone who always sees cut through. So I'm, I don't try and coach people. And I, I talk about this quite a lot. I'm more of a fitness instructor because I find that I don't really have the skills to be able to retrain the way people work. What I do is I tend to show them the answer and then find ways for them to remove, to, I, I give them the trust and confidence to just make and take that action, that decision. And then when they do it and it works, it, you know, it, they then they're like okay this is Reinforce. great so the danger is with that of course is that if you don't coach someone they never make the mistakes they don't go through the process themselves they don't learn it forever 
but so I so my approach is more like the PT instructor. You know, I'm I'm moving the weights up. I'm telling you how many reps you got to do. I tell you to do three more. I'm I, you know, but the moment I go, you might just revert back to going and hitting the hog and dust ice cream and you know and not and and I think a lot of ACOs have stopped working with me. Actually, go back to who they were before. They you know they they go back because you know success is. Re- Success is, you know, doing the right thing day in, day out. And failure is doing the wrong thing day in, day out. And so I'm just course correcting. I call it course correction. I'm trying to get people to enforce. I have a philosophy that I believe is, you know, a successful philosophy. And I try and get people to to understand that and embrace that and drive them down that route. But my skill, I guess, is to, is to deal with all the different complex personalities and try and also find them the right people because like for for example you're a good example of this because I find that it's very hard for me to work I'm good at working with like agency owners but I'm not so good at working with team members you know because team members do need coaching they need a different level of empathy than I have time to give them you know I've got apparently I've got high EQ I should have my EQ test done today I'm very highly self-aware which is great I have empathy but I'm probably too busy sometimes to sit down and coach over long periods of time in fact one of my colleagues who i work with he says who works with other non-execs he says i sit in board meetings with other non-execs and they spend six months trying to coach someone to do a new thing and you come in and you just tell them to do it and they do it <laughs> so but you know i think so, I, so it's really good to bring you in to situations for me like i find it hard to sometimes bring out the best in client services because they need the empathy that to relate to someone who's worked in their role before i haven't been an account manager i had fantastic account manager and client service in my teams mm. i had a really successful uh, uh, you know I made, I made a lot of mistakes but in the end i feel like i got a successful team through making lots of mistakes but um i think you know it's where sometimes you've got to bring the right people in to do the job who are going to be better than you and i'm also good at spotting that you know mm. So does that answer the question? It does. It's a fantastic answer. I wasn't expecting it to be answered like that, but absolutely. And I was going to ask you again as a, another one. If you were going to start again, because I know a lot of agency leaders yeah. that, are, that are here at the moment listening will be thinking, well, okay, so if you were going to start again, what are the things that you'd be doing differently? Like you've, you've said you've made a mistake. I'm sure a lot of us do. And you learn, that's how you learn sometimes. But you're very good at shortcutting the learnings for others. Yeah. So what are the like top three things that you would be doing differently if you're starting again now? Well, the, the, the thing that is, you know, really obvious. And, and I, I think, you know, people sometimes because I'm slightly more extroverted than I am introverted. So it's easy for you to say these things. But, you know, after probably, you know, Malcolm Gladwell says you've got to be 10,000 hours to be an expert. And I've done 20,000 hours now, you know, helping agencies grow and another 10 growing my own. And the, the one thing I've learned is that agencies do not exist without before even clients come on board. And even when clients do come on board, if you don't have leads coming into the business, you, you will not have clients. You will not have services, people, processes, profit, cash. You won't have any of those things. And so the number one thing you need to understand is how, how are leads generated? It's not about creating the best product in the world and then trying to figure out how you sell it. It's not, you know, you have to understand what is it that people, what is the, what is it the problem that you're going to solve as a service business? That's what we do. We solve, solve problems. What's the problem that we're solving and how am I going to create an abundance of people wanting to work with me to do that? So the first thing is, it is for me all about that. Now to create that in today's market. So if I started t- tomorrow and I, I do, I have this thing, there's a lot of people say, I, I'm not, I don't know who, who the person who maybe coined it, but there was a, I think it might've be someone like Jim Rohn or Tony Robbins. They said, you know, if, if all the wealthy people in the world lost all their money tomorrow, they'd all have it back in five years. I, I really firmly believe that. I believe the philosophy I have was, and it's not in a, you know, I, I, I'm not someone who is obsessed about money at all. It's not a thing for me, but it's the point is, is you see how to, you know, you see how to make life easier for yourselves, you know, often as entrepreneurs and you see where the commercial opportunity is. But in today's world, what would I do in simple terms? um, I've been a massive fan of Daniel Priestley. And I would first of all say, you know, read his book, Key Person of Influence, you know, established in a world, you know, full of, 
full of uh, people on social media, establish your expertise, work on your personal brand, your personal brand identity. Um, what, I mean, you did it before I did. Like I, I came across you before when I was just liking and sharing other people's LinkedIn posts. And, you know, I would see you there talking about client services, you know, you, you know, online, in video format, it was clear that you were an authority. And I think when I met you at the time, there was no other, I knew other people who did what you did, but you seemed the biggest authority because you spoke about it the most. So I'd read Key Person Influence, I'd work on my personal branding and my point of view and, and become an expert in what it is I'm looking to sell. And then the second thing I would just probably get some LinkedIn training um, and learn how to use it properly because I, I think it's like the, if it, if it was the top 40 charts right now for lead generation agencies, I think the fastest riser is LinkedIn. I'm very fortunate because I get to look at lots of pipelines every month. So I see where all the lead sources are in the last, since COVID started, LinkedIn has been one of the fastest growing areas for new business. Mm -hmm. It's now appearing regularly on, whereas gener generally actually Twitter, Instagram, they don't often appear on, they do, but not very often appear as lead sources in agencies. So, um, so if I started to get some more, I'd work on my personal brand. I'd work on l learning how to, to talk about the process, to share what I'm doing, to demonstrate my expertise. And I would, I would start to, I would start to build a really good network of connections because the number one way, now I've done, I ran two surveys this year, Jenny, one was the UK lead generation survey and one was the global lead generation survey. And if you take out the number two and number three way for, for agencies to get busy is always existing clients referring other clients or existing clients leaving. But if you remove those, cause they're already clients, the number one way is through networking, speaking, thought leadership and and you know and and so those three areas you need to build your connections you need to you know to you know to to set yourself some some numbers I mean I used to have this thing at Blue Halo where I'd meet 50 new people each month and I think today it doesn't it doesn't have to be new people but meaningful conversations on a regular basis will build your pipeline and if you build your authority then those two things come together so that's what I would do in a nutshell it's such good advice and then funny enough i've seen quite a few posts from agency owners saying i followed what spencer's telling me and this month i'm doing my 50 phone calls and it gets results and yeah. why, do, why do you think people resist it why do you think is it difficult and why do you think yeah i mean it's funny because it? so you know um a agency nomics isn't my first community that i set up and when in the early days of of uh, cactus i had a lot of people ringing me up with who were struggling in their businesses owners and I uh, I set up a, an early stage community and I used to do these talks in there and I used to share the I used to share the philosophy that you know if, if you make 50 new connections a month and you understand what they do and you share what you do and you're able to help them in some way so build some reciprocity and not not unauthentically but genuinely then business you know the more you help people the more business will come back and I knew that because actually when I analyzed my own pipelines you know there was one guy spent a million pound with me over 10 years because I helped fix his email in 1999 when he was made redundant and so you help people connect to people and keep in touch and so I used to tell people this and I remember going to a dinner in Manchester about two years ago and I hosted an agency dinner there. And so I said, yeah, well, you're, but you're always banging on about this meet 35 people a month and that's just impossible. And now it wasn't 50, it was 35. And I said, you know, it, it's Thursday. Um, I'm in Manchester. Um, every day of the week, I'm in a board meeting from 10.30 till five o'clock. And so that means that I've only had from... 8 30 to 10 30 and maybe the evening i said and just want to let you know that you guys are my i think it was the 70th people that i'd met that week because i did a speaking event the night before in fact you were there that week by the way the maa speaking event oh, there was yeah. about 35 40 people there yeah. that was quite that was a couple of years ago wasn't it, it? Was, and yeah, yeah. and and then i went to manchester on the thursday and there was anyway when you had i'd actually i'd worked out that i'd met 70 people in four days and it you know the reality is there are 22 working days in the month 21 22 working days if you talk to two people a day you know that's 44 people a month if you can't find a half you know an hour a day to have two conversations for half an hour over zoom you know with people that you used to work with you used to go to school with the ex-colleagues ex-customers 
then then you know then then well if you really want to be successful then that's what you need to do and every, by the way everyone has a number so although mine was 50 and that 50 meant i would because if you have 50 conversations serendipitously you will probably find two or three opportunities you don't find 50 you find one to three and of those three maybe one or you know two or three one will convert but that for me was worth about 200,000 a month when i was doing new business but there are people i know that do 100 and they bring in maybe 40 a month that's not a problem but you've got to know your number because mm -hmm. everyone will have a number based on the size the stage they're at who they are how they help people, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. I know this, it might sound a silly question, but are you finding that generally, particularly younger people, prefer not to speak face-to-face -face or on the phone? Um, I, I, is it a younger person thing? I, I don't know. I've, I've come across some... I've come across people, you know, of all ages who, who do and don't do it um is it a younger thing Poss possibly i mean i i i don't know i, I don't I, i'm not sure that i qualified enough or done enough research to identify whether or not the work the way people work has definitely changed but i would say you know i know some fantastic super connectors who are under the age of 30 who do do these things so, it's so, true. so maybe not I suppose I think... the reason I'm asking is in my work with account managers who always tend to be a lot, obviously a lot younger than me, I often say, well, how about picking up the phone or just call them, call them instead of, because, oh, I, I emailed and I said X, Y, and Z and I got an email back and they tell me this whole story of what's happened over email. And I said, well, how about just calling them or leaving a voice message or, you know, on LinkedIn? And I suppose that that was the reason for my question, really. And I was just wondering, is this a trend or I, is it? I, I mean, I, for me, I think that's um, yes. I think there probably is an overarching trend as communication has changed and people can use, you know, WhatsApp or text or Snap or whatever to, to communicate that they don't need to ring up and pick up the phone. Interestingly enough, my son, who's 15, he he talks into um he, he he talks his message his voice messages so he talks into his phone so they, they use snapchat and they just send each other voice messages all the time because right. it's easier than typing so they comment they commentate through games it's like doing a phone call so i don't know maybe we'll go full circle but from you know if i'm honest about it even 20 years ago maybe let's say 50 10 10 to 15 years ago with my client service team you know, I'd probably used to nag nagging them to pick the phone up more because anyone, as soon as email came out, it was very easy to hide behind it. it, it so, totally but I do think there's a lost art of of communications. I, I think there is a lost art of picking the phone up and, you know, not, not un I mean, I think through COVID, what was very exciting was all of a sudden, a lot of marketing managers and clients who are quite hard to get hold of suddenly had a bit more time because they weren't commuting. And and actually, I think a lot of people who hate networking, as an example, found it a lot easier to just Zoom call and speak to someone than having to go into a building full of men in, or women in suits or whatever. Do you know what I mean? That horrible mm. feeling of, and they could just do it in this kind of format. So, um, but yeah, but I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it, you know, it could well be a problem. And I think if you are an account manager listening to this or account director and you, you know, be different, be the 1%, be the ones that pick the phone up because that's how you're going to get cut through. You know, that's, that's, if you want to be successful, you've got to, you've got to do the marginal gain things. You've got to do the 1%. Yeah. So, I mean, you just got to find a way to overcome the fear because actually like all things, it's scary the first time, but once you've done it, you know, it's like speaking everyone, I meet so many people who are scared of public speaking, but you know, the reality is, is that, you know, you start off with a couple of people in your team. Say, can I test doing a talk with you two? Then you pick five and six. And and then, you know, one day you'll accidentally walk out like I did and there's 200 people and, you, you know, you can't even breathe. And But you do it and then you realise, oh, OK, I could do 200 now. And it just gets easier as it goes up. But you have to start somewhere, you know. I'm so glad, I'm so glad coming from you as well. That advice was so golden. Um, and for the other... For, for the creative agency account managers listening, do you have any other advice um, that from what you've seen teams doing exceptionally yeah. well with their clients? Well, I, I think, mistakes? I mean, I, I, I don't know whether we did talk about this in much detail, but you know, there's been a lot of, I think in the last 
eight weeks in particular, where are we now? We're sort of October, you know, 2020. And certainly about middle of August, Campaign Magazine started to do this kind of, it's the end of the account director, at the end of account manager. No one really sees them anymore as relevant. They're not needed. And I just don't believe that. I, I think that... Um, the, the problem the problem is is that the world because of because of technology now being at the heart of all marketing and advertising and and and, and agency businesses whether you're PR or whatever the technology is moving so fast that your business that your that business business growth has become exponential too it's growing you know it's doubling in fact the first time in history ever where technology has outstripped business requirements in the past technology could never keep up with business and now it's the other way around. So the point is, as a client, so as a account director, you have to be commercially aware about your client's business, but you've also got to understand their business is changing rapidly because of technology. So the problem is, is that you have to invest. So my advice would be, it doesn't matter how much time your company give you to do learning, research and learning and development. You've got to make your own time in the future world. You, you have to do what I do. You have to get up early every morning and walk before your day starts or get in a car or whatever you're going to do. Get on a scooter now. But you've got to listen and learn and about your clients' businesses and understand you know, where things are changing. You've got to be relevant or you'll just become irrelevant. You'll become commoditized. So my advice to anyone listening is, you know, is you, you know there's a, a famous meme going around you know warren buffett bill gates if you're not learning you're not spending five hours a week learning new things you're not re you're not going to be relevant I, I genuinely believe that and i think in fact i would predict that during this um in 2008 when the last recession hit 2009 a huge volume of client service people got made redundant from agencies because they didn't understand digital and what had happened in 2010 was digital come in. All they knew about was print, yeah, and, or and traditional advertising channels. Now they all got made redundant. They all came back two years later as social media experts. That's kind of the joke of the time. They went away, realized they'd missed it all, learned about social media, came back again, and got retrained. But they had to use a redundancy period to do that. The reason why we, I've already had five or six very senior client service directors I know been made redundant, and that's because they they know the world of websites and social media but they don't know the next world of digital transformation of you know of machine learning they don't understand the next wave where where technology is impacting on businesses so my advice would be come up with your own learning and development plan to keep yourself relevant to you know to find your expertise to understand your client's business and don't don't be a victim to your your company not giving you time to learn it's not about them it's about you it's about your future your career you know you'll become more valuable to that company to the clients to other organizations so don't look at it as a you know oh my company aren't paying me to get trained out of work out of hours don't worry about it just do it you know i'm sure you probably did that when you were working uh in roles short I, back in the day i always feel like i'm behind so i can never absorb enough information honestly there's not enough hours in the day um so i do have that drive to want to know more and i, I have noticed that some people do have that drive and others don't but i think that's such a good point like invest in yourself because it's about your career it's not necessarily just about the agency you're working with or the clients you're working with so, you know, if you work harder on yourself than you do in, than you do in your job, you'll always be more successful in life. Mm. That was said by Jim Rohn, and I, I mean, just to add, you know, actually, once I sold my business, I went back and I, I got told because I was a little bit anti Tony Robbins because he's always very positive and I'm very positive and it was, but someone told me a good friend of mine about um, Jim Rohn, who was Tony Robbins' mentor, and I listened to a, C, a CD by him, CD. I mean, I've got loads of them. I still can't play them anymore. But, mm -hmm. but you know, his philosophy back then, you know, he said things like, you know, skip a meal, but don't skip reading for an hour every day. I mean, that advice is timeless. You know, people say they don't have time, then just skip a meal and read, right? One, one, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. So I think, I think the advice hasn't really changed. But if you want to become more valuable in society, you need to, you know, you need to basically invest some time in developing yourself. Do you have any yeah. preferred sources of information that you go to, like your go-to places to keep on top of things? Do you know, when I had the agency, it's very probably different to where I am now, but when I had the agency, I was, I would, I, you know the term maven, I'd like, I would look for maven. So I would look for people who, uh, I read Malcolm Gladwell's Tipping Point, and in that book, he talked about how things go viral. And, and there's always 
some it's a maven at the beginning someone who's kind of knows about the future or is an evangelist for a certain trend and then you get connectors and salespeople down there who sort of spread the word but i used to follow certain mavens around certain areas so who are the people that are talking about what's next so for example i would probably again i'm going to do a bit of a, a marmite thing with everyone now half of me would watch Gary Vaynerchuk, because he's going to tell you about the next and future. Half, of, whether you love him or hate him, you're still going to watch him and listen. The other half of me would be watching Mr. Mark Ritson, because I want to know what is the now? What should I be doing strategically? Because the smart money is knowing where the now, next and future are. So I would bring the two of those together and go, I'm listening to you guys. And you know what? I do listen to those guys now. So I'd be looking when I had my business, I was I used to follow because I was in sports marketing. So I would look I would often stalk the bigger, more successful sports agencies, bigger, more successful sports brands, <coughs> individual thought leaders and futurists in those areas. And so I, I would always look for the to get some intuition around where things were going. So I'd probably look at, you know, in, you know, look at my clients. If I was people listening now, I'd look at my clients. I'd find the thought leaders in that space. I would follow them. I'd probably look at the services we sell and I'd probably tune into who is who's doing the best now and who's moving forwards. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, right, to look at an AC world now. And I know Stephen Bartlett's recently left Social Chain, but like his agency owner, his agency has grown from zero to 800 staff in four years. Well, there's something you know going on there. And he just happens to be an agency owner who's an influencer. So his personal brand, his thought leadership, has, and same with Vaynerchuk, he's Media. I mean, they've grown really quickly over a very short period of time mm -hmm. because of the way that they've acted in terms of their their um, personal brand. So, so yeah, so I would, I would, I would look, yeah, just tune into the experts it's quite hard because there's so much information out there now. Um, but certainly things like I was, um, there's a lot of very good podcasts. I think McKinsey do a very good podcast talking about future of industry. So find things that really focus on now, next to future of where you're, where you're focusing from a services and from a sector perspective. That's what my advice would be. Really amazing, brilliant advice. Um, I usually say to people also look at all of the management consultancy websites because they have the resource and the power, the money behind them to do these studies. And you've only got to be ahead of the curve a little bit, do a few readings of you know some of the reports that are coming out around, just as you say, the client's industry, your sector, to be one step ahead. So that's brilliant advice. What else are you seeing trends wise? Like particularly, I well, there's two questions really. One, who are the agencies or what are they doing differently that p are putting them at the sort of cutting edge maybe apart from building their personal brands, is there anything else that they're doing differently? I, mean, I think the big shift is probably organizational transformation in agencies. Uh, you know, I think COVID has been a, a very, uh, an accelerator in many ways for obviously the way, the, the, the flexible first approach to working. Um, this what we call an agile distributed model where maybe agencies now are able to attack attract a more diverse uh, uh, talent pool from a wider base because you don't have to worry about you know they can everyone can hopefully work to a certain degree via via video tools though I think we'll get a little bit worn down with it and probably we're craving a little bit more social face-to-face mm -hmm. -face interaction now I'm saying that now I've been really quite happy you're loving in, it aren't not, you? I have been loving <laughs> but even I'm this week feeling a little bit like I could just do going out with a a group of people more than 30 and having a good time out but um good night out but so I, I think the organizational transformation so what i mean by that is i think the big shift is is seeing uh, i'm seeing less hierarchies in businesses i'm seeing more flat meritocratic structures more grown-up approaches inside businesses you know less bosses and management and reporting lines and more people being trusted to do their job um i'm seeing people being more open and transparent around the numbers, the communication. So there's a fun, there's, you know, there's more experimentation in agencies, more willing to test and try new things. So I think I'm seeing some a sort of a bit of a movement, I think, around the organizational structure piece. I think that's the first thing. By the way, th there's nothing new to this. I mean, there, when we wrote our book, you know, um, which came out two years ago and, you know, probably wrote the section three or four years ago, there's a good few global agencies where they have this hybrid model of a, a sort of a core team and then a, a, maybe a, a freelancer extended team 
So I'm seeing some definitely some trends around that. And I've seen some trends around, I mean, I, I, I won't name check people here, but one client of mine in particular who, you know, was in a pitch against two traditional agencies. And this is an agency that only has one employee, which is the managing director. And the whole team is uh, uh, consultants, experts in this particular field. And they got chosen as the agency of choice um, for a FTSE 100 company wow. uh, because they preferred the model of saying, look, you only bring in the talent when we need it. You bring in higher quality talent mm -hmm. rather than, but you see 10 years ago, I, lo I remember I was talking to a big a FTSE 250 organization who crucified me because I had a contractor in and they saw on LinkedIn that they weren't working for me. So it's again, so there's another trend. I think the clients are maturing. The clients are going to be working more remotely. I think that means a better distribution of wealth around the UK. I think we'll start to see people who choosing agencies near where they live rather than near the central London office. So there's definitely some things. I mean, I, when people say about people giving up offices, I still say it's fairly split. I think around half of people have considered giving up the office and another half are like, nope, we still need somewhere to meet and still need somewhere to, to, you know, to, to, to for, forge our culture of people. Mm. So um, I don't know what other trends am I seeing at the do, moment? Do you think that the people that have been made redundant or because obviously we're heading towards the end of the furlough yeah. period for those in agencies that are going to unfortunately be made redundant, do you see a trend for them setting themselves up as consultants or freelancers? Rather than sort of... Yeah, I mean, the problem the problem we've got in the economy right now is we have this thing called IR35, which is very annoying, which means that basically if you're self-employed, you can't work for just one person without the company having to pay your taxes. Mm -hmm. And so as a self-employed contractor, yeah, you, you've you got to have multiple employees employers and you know they, they scrapped they were going to put the change the law in this year and they didn't do it and so it needs modernizing definitely to protect people from being exploited you know it's, it's not a bad thing why it's been delayed and, and, and taken time so yes I think inevitably when there's a lot of redundancies people will like I did when I was made redundant they, they use the opportunity to go and try and start to work for themselves and to do things so I definitely think so I I I'm going to set, make a bit of a blanket statement here, which is from what I've seen, most of the people that have been made redundant are, are been made redundant because their jobs that, because they haven't moved with the times, I, you know, or, and there's a caveat, or they genuinely were affected by travel by, because the, the, there's only about four or five sectors that have really been hit. I want to be really clear about this. 99% of sectors in, this, in the country are actually doing okay. Like they're not, they're not booming, but some of them are booming like SAS, but, but there is only really a handful of sectors that are struggling, but some agencies just unluckily had everyone in that space. But apart from that, last night there was a post, a good friend of mine works as a, in um, a user experience and someone asked for some user experience people and I put a name up, a friend of mine who's just been made redundant. And that post must have had like 60 names on it by the morning. Wow. And it just goes to show how user experience has become more commoditized. And so it's almost like you've got to keep going up this value chain. But what I would say is I've not seen many people who are working you know, quite strongly in technology in a sector that hasn't been hit by, you know, like travel or high street retail that isn't very secure in their jobs. So I would say if people are being redundant, do take a good long look at what, what you're doing, where your role is, and do you need to, do you need to progress it now to another area, which is more future proofed? I think that's really, really good advice. Um, I'm just conscious of your time. We're coming up to the hour. Can you believe it? It's been so uh, to talk to you all day, Spence. Can you tell us what projects are you working on right now? What's exciting you? So I've got a, a couple of really big announcements coming up. We're doing a couple of partnerships, uh, which is really exciting for me. Um, I think the main thing is we're, we're working on building our, our training library for agency owners, which I'm hoping to tap you up for some, some account yeah. client service training in there as well. So very much, you know, that's been something we've been working on now for a couple of years. It's, it's been taking a while because we're so busy to try and get done, but we are getting there. So the training stuff's really exciting for us. We've just launched some mastermind um, workshops, which has been the, almost the first time we've been able to act, offer people maybe a low cost ac uh, access to us. Because obviously being on exec, you, 
you end up being a premium sort of day rate, but this is a way to get make us more, you know, more relevant, uh, so more accessible by people with smaller budgets, but still get access to our to our toolkits, which which we've developed over the last nine years. Um, to be honest, you, I'm loving it, and it, it's just really building. We're building a team around the country. We've just taken on someone for the northwest. I think we were traveling in the early days everywhere, and now we're realizing that actually there are better people in the regions that can do these things for us. So that's been exciting. And the community, as you mentioned at the beginning, you know, we're on our way to 800 members now, very, very close. And the engagement, the statistics have been just honestly so good. I mean, the engagement rates are so high. I think we score excellent on every single rating in the, the analytics on the platform, which is really nice. And as you said at the beginning, which I, I'm a little bit shocked too. Everyone's so nice in there. And it's weird because because it's free. You think you'd get all of the kind of troublemakers in there. But totally. weirdly, I don't know, maybe COVID, maybe people have got more humble and, hu- you know, sort of uh, more sort of more humility maybe through this period. But, but it would really stand out if anyone wasn't nice. Yeah, wouldn't there, it? Wouldn't it? It would be like, oh, no, that's and not what we do And it does. When your do person does something, you're like, all right. So, yeah. <laughs> no, so, it, yeah, just more world domination, really. <laughs> when it comes Basically, to I mean, yeah, just, you're definitely you know, on the way. We, we've got, lots, yeah, we've got a few, good, good few announcements coming up. We've got some new partnerships coming in, which I think will be really exciting as well. So, yeah, no, all good. All progressing really nicely and all good fun. So if, who would you like to hear from? Because obviously some people will be listening to this thinking, oh, I didn't know he did um, consultancy. I didn't know there was a community. What's the best way of contacting you and who who would really benefit from contacting you that, the most um i think if you if you are a um if you are an agency owner or a shareholder on company's house you know with more than a team of three because I, I i'm trying to avoid having freelancers in the community because it will just become up because we do it all in our spare time it's all run for free so and you've got more than three people then please or if your boss is that person or you know you're whatever you know someone who who owns an agency please you know point them in the direction of agencynomics.com and um and you know if you're that person then come in there and try come come along to an event and say hi to me i think the best thing with me now these days is if you can is try and see where i'm talking come along listen and ask the questions and and then maybe uh we'll try and try and talk through there um and yeah i think you know i'm on linkedin uh if you if you want to connect to me please send me a personal message and you'll need my email address which is spg at cact.us that's SPG Sierra Papa Golf or Spencer Paul Gallagher even at CACT, CACT.us. Um, but please send me a message because I only accept people now who kind of give me a bit of a backstory and connecting. And yeah, I mean, you know, that LinkedIn is probably the best way to get a hold of me. If you want to, you know, and just check out cactus.com website. You know, there's, there's an inquiry form on there. If you know anyone that might want to work with us at some stage, point them in that direction it's my that's a shameless plug i'm not really that salesy normally Listen, no you're not even you're not being salesy spencer you're probably the, one of the most generous and well <laughs> networked people i know really because you help everyone and you know to to put your email address and you know the, the contact i just think you'd be foolish not to if you're out there and you're an agency owner not to take part because there's just so much benefit yeah. and you're getting just don't expect to go you. You think people some people go as i, I said jane this morning it's like the, the problem is is that um as i said at the beginning I, i'm looking after quite a lot in fact, I've, at the moment i've got a couple of big agencies who are, who are selling and a couple of sort of doing um like uh who are, who are doing sort of get you have get selling it to their team so different types of ways of selling businesses and and actually that takes a lot of time up so sometimes i feel a bit like i want to make myself accessible but eventually gets a bit hard so don't be too offended if um if you uh if if you want to have a uh, a video call with me and you've got to wait a couple of months but it, it will come around quick enough so book it in you know that's Absolutely. what i say yeah and, and just as i said everyone is you know there's not a day that goes by without someone saying thank you to you so you are changing lives genuinely through your work so you must be really, really proud of that. And I just want to yeah, say a huge it, thank you. 
they say, don't they, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And I think it probably applies to your personal brand too. So, and it's only really been the last sort of few months where I've started to hear people saying nicer things. It's quite embarrassing in a way, but it's, you know, it's, um, it's, I'm grateful for the people that take time to say thank you. If I've helped, Peter, I've helped in any way or any of the guys at Cactus. And I would say, you know, um, it's another good lesson, really. If anyone helps you on your journey out there, have a little think and don't be afraid to say thank you to them. You know, it's just a really nice thing. And people will take a lot of a lot from it if you do take the, make the time to thank people that helped you on your journey. Totally agree. And very well deserved. Thank you so much for joining me, Spencer. I really, no really appreciate it. Lovely questions. All right. Thank you.